When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, everybody. I'm Jared Halverson. So grateful to have you back for some more scripture study time here on Unshaken. This is our second episode for this 2021 Come Follow Me year of the Doctrine and Covenants. And the fact that you're back for more is a good sign. I used to joke with my institute students that when they come back for the second class, it always feels like a second date to me, which means that the first date must have gone good enough that they're coming back for more. As one who has had more first dates than second dates throughout life, that's always a relief to me. So I'm grateful for your response to the first uh, lesson from the Doctrine and Covenants. And now this second one, we're actually shifting from the Doctrine and Covenants to the Pearl of Great Price as we study the life of Joseph Smith, at least the part regarding the first vision, the first 26 verses of Joseph Smith history. Now last week we talked about going Joseph Smith's transition from a translator to a revelator, translating ancient scripture in the Book of Mormon to revealing new scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. But what we see today in Joseph Smith history is in some ways more of the prophetic role, that it's his life and not just his teachings that are worth being canonized. So often through the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, it's narrative, it's stories. And the fact that stories can be canonized lets us know something about Scripture. It's not just theology, it's not just doctrine being preached to you, it's more than, than pure revelation. It's life. It's, it's that reality that we talked about at the end of last week's lesson in Alma 32. And in some ways it's so fitting. One of my favorite phrases from the introduction to the Doctrine and Covenants says that these sacred revelations were received in answer to prayer in times of need and came out of real life situations involving real people. Again, do you sense that reality there? Real life situations, real people, people like you and like me, situations like the ones that we find ourselves in. The 19th century in some ways is very different than the 21st, but it's not that far removed especially as far as human emotion and human perception based on common human experience. And in some ways, nowhere is that more true than in these first 26 verses of Joseph Smith history, where Joseph introduces himself and his family as just the common, ordinary, everyday Americans trying to eke out an existence on the frontier of Western New York and combining their physical challenges with spiritual needs. Again, does it sound familiar? So much of this is what we're going through. And as Joseph Smith is searching for truth, trying to make sense of so many different voices that are sounding in his ears, what he does as he goes in search of that truth is so relevant to our situation. Again, it shows that life, common, ordinary, everyday life, can be scriptural, that we can find principles there that are eternal and worth living. I hope that the Spirit will alert us to some of those principles as we study these scriptures today. And perhaps even more importantly, that the Spirit will wake you up to some of the scriptural principles that are manifest in your own life. You may not get canonized for the whole church, but your life can become scripture for yourself. Now we're going to talk about the first vision today, an incredible epiphany, opening the heavens. Again, that hearken that we talked about last week. But it's one that has brought a lot of skepticism, both when it first happened as well as ever since. I remember when I was studying at Vanderbilt, there was a professor in the religious studies department that was teaching an undergraduate class on the history of Christianity. And he called me up, I guess he'd found out that there was a Latter-day Saint at the Divinity School, and said, oh, we're going to teach a class on the history of Christianity, and we'd have one lecture on Mormonism. Would you come and explain your church to us? So I went, and in this room full of undergrads, tried to explain in an hour as much as I could about the foundations of the church. But the most interesting part was at the end of class, there was a little bit of time for question and answer. The students had some questions to ask, but the one that stands out in my memory was one asked by the professor. And you could tell the way he was trying to voice it, that, that he was hesitant even to, to, to raise the issue. He says, yeah, I've got a question. Uh, I mean, I know that the 19th century was full of these kinds of visionary experiences. It was Second Great Awakening and all this religious enthusiasm and things. So I can understand why the, the story of the first vision or the coming forth of the Book of Mormon would resonate 
with 19th century Americans, I mean, especially the uneducated that are living out on the frontier, right? Almost this condescending tone on the part of the professor, like, oh, well, you know those rustic 19th century Americans, right? They'll, they'll believe anything. But then he said, but, but as a Latter-day Saint today, I mean, you guys don't, and you could tell he was almost like, do I, do I dare even say it? He's like, I mean, you guys don't, you, you don't believe this stuff, do you? And it was so interesting that here I am with a religious studies scholar that's expressing almost this default position of skepticism masked as, oh, rationalism, pure rationalism. We're going to stop at the natural and not, not even allow for the supernatural. I mean, it's not, it's not scientifically empirical. Could these things possibly happen in, in, a, in a modern day? And I just sat there almost speechless for a second as I thought, wow, here's a religious studies scholar that doesn't really believe in the core of religion, which is the miraculous, the ineffable, the divine, the transcendent, something that transcends common, ordinary, everyday experience. And as I gathered my thoughts and summoned my courage, I looked at this professor and smiled and said, oh yeah, we still believe this. We really do believe that these things really happened. I think it took that professor aback, probably took some of the students aback, but I was grateful to declare in an academic setting a testimony of sorts of the truthfulness of the kinds of things that we'll be studying today. And ironically, what we'll see at the end of today's class about this Methodist minister that Joseph first sh shared the story with, that just automatically, again, default position, skepticism in the disguise of pure rationalism, saying those kinds of things just can't happen in our day. Anciently, sure, I'll accept that. But in modernity, no. Heavens are closed. God has been muzzled. No more prophets and apostles. Now to add to the irony, among those who want to attack the first vision in our day, especially among former members of the church, there seem to be two main complaints that they raise. Now, both of these concerns that people raise are largely historiographical. Not just historical, but historiographical, which means the writing down of history. And their first concern is, why didn't Joseph Smith write it down earlier? And along those lines, there's this concern of, well, why didn't he talk about it more? How come so many of the records that we have of him talking about the first vision come relatively late? But again, you realize how people responded to it the first time Joseph Smith did talk about this? Yeah, I'd probably not talk about it as much myself as well. Especially when, and you can tell this from his earliest account of the first vision, at the beginning it seemed like it was meant to be more of a personal experience. And with the passage of time, some distance for perspective, Joseph Smith could realize that experience in 1820 was so much more than just about me. It was more than me and forgiveness for my sins. This was so that God could usher in the dispensation of the fullness of times, so that all of his children could feel that redemption, could feel that forgiveness of sin. And the second so-called issue that people raise with the first vision is the fact that there are multiple accounts in existence, with some difference in terms of the way it is described which, honestly, we should expect as Joseph is teaching and explaining the first vision at different times to different audiences with different purposes in mind. There's a lot of great resources out there if you want to study more deeply these other accounts of the first vision. I love them all. They seem to shine light on different facets of this experience for Joseph Smith and bring out different principles that we can relate to. The Gospel Topics essays on the church website are an excellent resource on that. The Joseph Smith Papers Project online is awesome. There are other great videos out there that do a good job of, of summarizing what comes out of these different accounts, as well as full books that have been written about it as well. Some bringing out and analyzing the differences in each account, and others seeking to harmonize them. Again, both of those two approaches have been taken with biblical studies as well. And both are very valuable and helpful. And yet the irony here, again, as I study anti-religious rhetoric and try to make sense of how do people attack faith, and these two opposite approaches, for the most part, people have already decided for themselves whether they believe it or not. And if the goal is to disprove things, they don't care how they get there. And so they take either option. Because on the one hand, if they're complaining that Joseph Smith didn't write down accounts of the first vision, he didn't talk about it. And on the other hand, well, he's written all these multiple accounts of the first vision. It's almost like, make up your mind. Did he not talk about it enough? 
or did he talk about it too much? And to be honest, and this is really what matters most to me, particularly for those who say, oh, well, I can't trust any of these multiple accounts of the first vision. I simply kind of pause things and ask them, well, do you believe that visions are possible in the first place? If you don't, that's fine. But then why are we even kind of wrangling over multiple accounts when you wouldn't believe any account since it deals with the supernatural, since it deals with the miraculous, the divine, the non-empirical? If that is a non-starter for you, then why are we continuing the conversation at all? And this is one of those instances where a premise has predetermined the conclusion. And if your premise is that God cannot speak, or that God cannot appear, or that there is no God to begin with, then I guess we're kind of done with the conversation. You don't believe that visions are possible. And that's fine. But I do believe they're possible. Think about the seventh article of faith. We believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. Do we? Or make it more personal? Do you? I remember years ago going through the Articles of Faith, one by one, and as I pondered them, I did a gut check. And I thought, I know we believe these things that collectively as members of the church, we're supposed to be able to mentally uh, assent to these kinds of beliefs. But do I? And as I pondered and prayed, one by one, when I felt like I was able to, in my scriptures, I crossed out the word we and inserted in its place the word I. So that for me, it's not we believe, it's I believe. And I do believe in tongues and interpretation of tongues. I do believe in prophecy and revelation. And yes, I believe in visions. And unless and until you make room to allow for those kinds of transcendent experiences where the veil can part, again, the parting of the veil from heaven to earth as far as a vision is concerned, is not that different. Yes, it is in many ways, but not that different than the parting of the veil to allow the Holy Ghost to come into our heart. And if we've had those kinds of experiences, I hope that it would open us to the kinds of experience that Joseph Smith is describing in the first vision. And for any of you who have tried to make the attempt of putting the ineffable into words, of translating the transcendent, of bringing heaven down to earth in some way, I would hope that you'd have a little empathy for Joseph Smith's multiple attempts to put those experiences down into words. Remember Lehi's experience where he is a visionary man and Laman and Lemuel jump on him for that? Oh, dad, you're such a visionary man. At one point of, of real struggle, his wife even gives the, him the same accusation. And Lehi takes that this is textbook husband and wife uh, relationships here. Uh, Lehi says, honey, you're right. Always a great way to diffuse the, the, the contention. He says, honey, you're right. I am a visionary man, guilty as charged. But do you see what a blessing that is? If it weren't for my visions, we would have stayed in Jerusalem. You're right about that. But we would have perished with the people there. I will treasure my visions and trust in them, even if other people have a struggle with those who claim to be visionary themselves. And that was a gift that Lehi had that evidently Laman and Lemuel lacked and that even Sariah lacked herself. And that's okay. We all have different spiritual gifts. But even when Lehi tries to explain one of the visions that he has, it's interesting the words that he uses. Back in 1 Nephi 1, where he has this first vision, his own first vision, it says, being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens open. And notice this, he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels. Now some, skeptical, would say, what, what, what do you mean he thought he saw? But, but hold on to that for a second. What am I seeing here? What is going on? This is so far beyond any experience I've ever had. Those times where you kind of rub the eyes and think, wait, is this, is this really happening? Fast forward seven chapters. 
And in 1 Nephi chapter 8, when he is explaining his dream, remember how he says that at the beginning? I have dreamed a dream. Or in other words, I have seen a vision. There seems to be a lot of similarity between revelatory dreams and revelatory visions. And again, there are those skeptics who would wave away either option. But if you think about dreams, and again, that's a spiritual gift that some people have. That's a way that God communicates with his children. But think about dreams and how real they are. But then you wonder, wait, is this really happening? When you wake up and you're still wondering, did that, was I awake? Was I asleep? What's, what's happening there? So when Lehi begins to describe this dream and he says, Behold, me thought I saw in my dream a dark and dreary wilderness. I'm trying to feel my way through this. I'm trying to make sense of the experience that I had. I thought I saw God. Me thought I saw this dark and dreary waste. When Alma the Younger has his own experience, his own visionary epiphany with God, during those three days of unconsciousness, as his mind lays hold of the thought of Jesus Christ, remember what he said? Me thought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels. The same ineffability, hard to put into words. Am I seeing? What am I seeing? I, I think it's this. I mean, in some ways, it reminds me of section 76, which, which we'll get to in, I don't know, six, seven months from now. But when Joseph and Sidney are having these visions of the degrees of glory, Joseph would describe what he sees. And Sidney would give second witness. Yes, that's what I'm seeing too. And then it was almost tag team. And Sidney would describe what he's seeing. And then Joseph, well, yes, that's what I'm seeing too. And you can picture these two trying to make sense of what is unfolding to their view. Another great example is Paul. When Paul is having a visionary experience, in fact, speaking of Paul's visionary experiences, his vision of the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, there are multiple accounts of that vision as well. And they don't all agree perfectly with each other. And that's okay. I believe in Paul's vision just like I believe in Joseph Smith's. Look at how either man lived the rest of their lives. Whatever they saw or tried to make sense of, it changed them permanently. And so I will give both men the benefit of any doubt as they're trying to make sense of the experiences that they've had. Later, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaking of himself in the third person. He says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. And then this, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. This is Paul's vision of the degrees of glory as he's caught up to the third heaven. But am I in the body? Am I not in the body? I don't know. I can't tell. God knows what's going on. But this is so far beyond the, the natural man. Remember Moses in his vision, his epiphany. I had to be transfigured to be able to even endure the presence of God. What is this transfiguration? In fact, that's the word that's used in 3 Nephi. When the three Nephites are changed but what does this change entail? Remember, Mormon is trying to make sense of this himself. In fact, the three Nephites themselves were trying to make sense of it. Third Nephi 28, 15, whether they were in the body or out of the body, they could not tell, for it did seem unto them like a transfiguration of them. Later in Joseph Smith's life, he uses similar language as he has a vision of the celestial kingdom. He says, this is now in section 137 of the Doctrine and Covenants. He says, the heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God and the glory thereof. And then this phrase, which should now be familiar to us, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. You see what I'm trying to, to make sense of? Again, just study. If, if the idea of visions is too much for you, as it was too much for that professor at Vanderbilt, again, I can't blame you. It's, it's beyond the mundane. It's beyond the natural. That what makes it supernatural. It's not purely rational, but it's not irrational. It's simply super rational, beyond rationality, not, not beneath it, not below it, not in its absence. That's the irony. We'll see so much of what happens today in the first vision's aftermath as they ridicule and mock these things. They're trying to make the super rational into the irrational, and they're staking claims to pure rationality for themselves and their perspectives alone. So much of human existence 
is non-rational. So yes, some of it downright irrational, but so much of it, love and beauty, human experience, the humanities as opposed to the sciences, those do not have to be purely rational. As I've joked with friends before, those that are pure rationalists, or at least claim to be, since I don't actually think that exists in the human race, but those who want to make everything purely rational, good luck with your marriage. Good luck with your relationships. The fact we are humans and not mere robots should open ourselves to the non-rational experiences of life. Love, poetry, art, beauty, faith, spirit. As Goethe said, reality divided by reason still leaves a remainder. What we'll study today is in the remainder the incredibly ineffable, beautiful experience where God comes through the veil and connects with his children. If you have not yet had an experience like that in any degree, then of course the first vision will be hard for you to accept. But for those of you who have, who have had dreams, who have had revelation, who have had spiritual experience, who have sensed the, the, the divine pull upward that is transcendence, then your experience studying the first vision may be more personal than it's ever been before as you realize that Joseph's experience as compared to your own is only a difference of degree, not a difference of kind. Now, to teach this, at least the first 20 verses of Joseph Smith history, which describe the first vision experience, I have a little test of sorts for you. Not a test of your knowledge, simply a test of your endurance. And what I'm asking you to endure has less to do with the quantity of information in the next part of this video, but rather the quality of the production values of the video itself. You see, last year was the bicentennial of the first vision. I made a video in which I simply studied verse by verse the first 20 verses of Joseph Smith history. Now, because I'd only created this channel a few weeks earlier, production values were horrible. Since then, some very kind people have offered, can we help you? Here's a little money, get yourself a webcam. Uh, here's a little more money, get yourself a microphone. Please, we have faith in your content, but you're killing us as far as production values are concerned. I'm grateful for all of you approaching this channel with a certain degree of 1 Samuel 16, 7 in you, that you look upon the heart and beyond the outward appearance. I'm grateful for that, but I'm going to test it now. Because rather than refilm this lesson on the Joseph Smith history, the first 20 verses, I want to play for you the video that I filmed last March. Honestly, I thought about doing the whole thing over again with a little bit better audio and video. But as I got past that initial pain of production value, I realized that the Lord really had been teaching me something that day that seemed to come forth loud and clear through that video. It was one of those beautiful experiences where the teacher is learning himself or herself as she goes through the lesson. In fact, it reminded me of the experience of actually filming it in the first place. At the time, I wasn't sure if I was even going to do it. It was kind of a bonus episode that had to do with more with General Conference than with the Book of Mormon that we were studying. I wasn't good at filming lessons. I'm still not, but I was even worse back then. But I just turned on the camera, and without any notes, without any lesson prep, just said, okay, God, I'm going to open my mouth. Please fill it as you've been so kind to do in the past. And honestly, I felt that he did in ways that I still pray he does for me. Anytime I have to sit down in an empty room and stare into a blank camera. So there's the trial of endurance for you. For the next hour, will you look past the video and hear past the audio and watch and listen for the principles that we can find in the first 20 verses of Joseph Smith history. And when that portion ends, I'll come back with, again, hopefully slightly better video and audio to teach the last six verses, the immediate aftermath of the first vision. There's some beautiful principles there too. So think of this as a flashback of sorts. And like in so many movies that do that, we're going back to black and white, though not quite. And I'll see you back here in an hour with verse 21. If you can remember back to January 1st, 
2020, seems like a lifetime ago, President Russell M. Nelson sent out a tweet, a Facebook post, a, a blog message, inviting all of us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ to celebrate this year as the bicentennial year of the first vision of Joseph Smith. As we commemorate this ongoing restoration that we're a part of, President Nelson invited us to do several things, one of which was to read afresh the account of the first vision as published in the Pearl of Great Price. And I'd like to do that with you today. In fact, I got a new set of scriptures without any markings so that I could truly read afresh this account. I don't have any of my notes. I have taught Joseph Smith history many times in the past in various classes, but I want to come at it with fresh new eyes to be able to see what the Lord would have me learn and perhaps you learn as well as we do this. So I hope you'll join me. Verse 1. Owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons in relation to the rise and progress of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all of which have been designed by the authors thereof to militate against its character as a church and its progress in the world. Notice the reason Joseph is writing this. This is an odd way to begin a history. Uh, this is not in the beginning. Uh, this is not a long time ago in a western New York hamlet far, far away. This is, there's a reason for our teaching this. There's a reason to produce this history, and it's because there are reports that are in circulation put out there by evil disposed and designing persons. Anti-Mormonism is as old as Mormonism. Darkness has as much experience as light in many ways. And what Joseph was up against in trying to explain what was happening, the church was growing by leaps and bounds. I've spent the last 10 years or so studying anti-religious rhetoric, anti-religious conflict. How do people attack one another in issues of faith? And I'm amazed that usually there is a spike in persecution when there is a spike in growth. There was a huge amount of anti-shaker rhetoric, anti-shaker literature, when shakerism was growing. I think there's one shaker left, some poor little old lady in Maine right now. Uh, there's not a whole lot of anti-shaker rhetoric anymore. Now we love them, we buy their furniture, we're, we're, it's a quaint little piece of Americana. But as the church grows, there are those who will militate against its character. Notice, by the way, to militate its, against its character as a church. That, that's an interesting thing that's happening in our day, especially in the wake of all that's come out from the Wall Street Journal and the, the, the wealth of the church. Uh, there was a, years ago, there was an, a an article, I think, in Time or Life, some big magazine, Newsweek maybe, that said Mormon Inc. Incorporated, that a militating against this character as a church. Is this a money-making venture? Is this, what is this? Even people inside the church that sometimes treat it as though it weren't a church. Uh, Sister Bonnie Oscarson gave an amazing talking conference years ago about how do we view, is, the, is this a quorum of the Twelve or is this a board of directors? Is this a church or is this a social club when the, there are reports in circulation, there are people attacking, and it's always been that way. Uh, as one of my, for one of my master's theses, I did a study of every newspaper article I could possibly find during the lifetime of Joseph Smith that described the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. There are hundreds of them. And I was amazed to see the character of those trying to militate against the church, to be able to see how frequently how almost invariably the word that was spreading around the United States at the time about Mormonism was evil disposed, it was designing, it was militating against its character as a church. And as a result of that, Joseph says, middle of verse 1, I have been induced to write this history to disabuse the public mind. What a verb, to disabuse. This suggests that the public mind had been abused. I really got that sense in all the research that I did for that master's thesis, that the public mind, I wanted to see, again, if you just read the newspapers, if you never knew anything else about the church, but you just saw what was kind of in the water, in the air, what did people assume about it, what, what were you hearing? And it was amazing how abused the public mind was. It's been that way ever since. And so what Joseph Smith is trying to do in giving them a true history is to disabuse them. I think sometimes we have to unlearn before we can relearn. Sometimes there are false impressions, and honestly, I was amazed to think of any of our pioneer, pioneer ancestors, if a Latter-day Saint missionary knocked on their door, 
what would they have to get through or get over or get around as far as their misconceptions or preconceived notions would have been based on the things that they heard or read about the coming forth of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, first thing then, to disabuse the public mind, and second, to put all inquirers after truth in possession of the facts. I love this. Joseph just wants to put in possession of the facts any inquirer after truth. This is what happened. You can do with it as you may. In fact, he says, I want to put you in possession of the facts as they have transpired in relation both to myself and the church. This is going to be about his history, but also about the church's history. Those two are inextricably linked. That's why often people trying to take down the church, they want to take down Joseph Smith because the two are so intertwined. Uh, in relation both to myself and the church, so far as I have such facts in my possession. Now that's an interesting admission too, historically. I want to give you the facts as they've transpired and as I have them in my pe uh, possession. It almost seems like there's a temporal split there. As this is what happened, and here's the facts as I have them. And sometimes that's, that's all we can have. So often we don't have all the facts as they transpired. We have what's in possession. I study history. That's where my degrees are, are. And to see, we are at the mercy of documents. And so to be able to have what we have, I'm grateful for. There is so much more I wish we had. So many more documents, so many other things. Uh, but to be to be open to whatever else comes. I'm grateful for the transparency of the Church History Department right now and the Joseph Smith Papers Project. It's amazing how much information is we're being flooded with uh, so that we can have the facts as far as we can possibly possess them. Verse 2, In this history I shall present the various events in relation to this church in truth and righteousness. I'm going to present them. A friend of mine pointed out that later on in this chapter there are two other P words. This one is simply present. Joseph is not trying to, to prove. That's one of the others. He's not trying to promote. That's the other. He's simply trying to present. Uh, Arthur Henry King was a convert to the church, an incredible literary scholar who joined the church and later became an English professor at Brigham Young University. And he talks about how simple and straightforward, rhetorically, Joseph Smith history really is. He says, I was amazed that I wasn't trying to be pulled or pushed or proven. I was just having information presented. Those aren't his words. That's, those are Joseph's words. But to see the way Arthur, Dr. King said, he said, I have spent my whole career trying not to be impressed by things. Does that sound like your English professors? He said, but I couldn't help but be impressed by the straightforward simplicity of Joseph's account in the Pearl of Great Price. He said, I could tell that this is a man who believed what he said and was simply trying to present truth. He wasn't trying to make me feel anything. This is what happened. Take it or leave it. You see the similar approach in, what is it, section 127 of the Doctrine and Covenants, when Joseph is like, you know what? I've had an interesting life. Persecution is deep water is what I want to swim in. It's always been this way. As if I must have been good or evil uh, intended. He says, I'll let you judge. Leave it in the hands of God. I, I love how how almost nonchalant Joseph is in his with his reputation in these passages. I'll, I'll let you judge. I'm just going to present the history. He says, I will present the facts or the events in relation to this church in truth and righteousness as they have transpired or as they at present exist. Again, there's this seems to be this juxtaposition as far as historiography is concerned. This is these are the things as they transpired or as they now at present exist. And there's a difference there. I think sometimes we're so close to the action, we don't have the perspective yet to see if, if it means anything. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, nobody called World War I, World War I in the 1920s or 30s. It wasn't until there was a World War II that they had to go back and go and say, I guess that was World War I. Y2K was a huge scare at the end of 1999. That would have made all the history books if they'd been written as they transpired. But as they at present exist, 20 years later we can look back and say y the Y2K scare was not scary at all. Nothing came of it. So that's, is it even going to make the history books? Again, if, if you're trying to make sense of history, I, I love the fact that Joseph is grappling with both. 
This is what I thought it meant in 1820. This is what I know it now means in 1838. And we can do the same thing in, in the history of the church now. Things that loomed large in the moment that have diminished in significant sense or vice versa. He now begins his story. This is where we this is where we would probably assume the story would begin rather than those first two verses of explaining kind of why he's writing. I was born in the year of our Lord, 1805, on the 23rd day of December. I remember once asking a seminary class, just kind of off the cuff, how old was he when that happened? And they looked at me in disbelief going, wait, how old was he when he wrote this? I'm like, no, no, no. How old was he when that happened in verse 3, when he was born in the year of our Lord, 1805? And they're like, what? He was zero. I'm like, no, 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 really. How old was he? Some of the more... I guess some of the people who just got out of biology class came and said, nine months? Like, no, I'm not talking gestation. How old was he? And it was just a fun way to, to start talking about who Joseph was premortally, among the noble and great spirits that God said, these I will make my rulers, the ones that had been foreordained. Joseph himself said, I suppose I was foreordained because he just said, everyone who's been who, who works for the salvation of other people in this life was foreordained to that very responsibility before having come. Uh, Joseph Smith was born in 1805 as a very, very old baby. The same can be said of each of us. But here's a man who was foreordained and prepared from before the foundation of the world to help bring forth the restored gospel. The NC 138 is the best place to study that. All of us who received our first lessons in the world of the spirits. Well, Joseph would have been uh, among the teacher's pets in those pre-mortal classrooms. He was born in the town of Sharon, Windsor County, state of Vermont. I don't know if you had a chance to go there, but it's well worth the trip. I used to teach teenagers that often would go on church history trips for their senior trip. And when they came back, I'd ask them, what were your favorite spots? Uh, a lot of their favorites I expected. They loved the Sacred Grove. They loved the Hill Cumorah. They loved uh, Nauvoo. They loved Kirtland. They said there were two places that surprised them, and in telling me about it, surprised me. They said, I, was, I was amazed how many different people independently would say, I didn't expect anything here, but it was amazing. One of those places was Adam on Diamond. They loved Adam on Diamond, and yet they said, there was nothing there. It's like open farm fields. But there's a spirit there that is amazing. And this other place that they said that they were surprised at how much they loved it, what they felt there, was Sharon, Windsor County, state of Vermont. I am grateful to be able, have been able to be there and just to feel the peace of that place. I didn't expect anything either. I'm like, well, technically Joseph didn't really do anything here. He showed up. If anything, give Lucy Mack the credit, okay? Uh, she did all the work that day. But there's something about those wooded hillsides in Vermont that an amazing soul came to earth. In fact, you know, an amazing soul came to an amazing family. Verse 3 continues. My father, Joseph Smith Sr., left the state of Vermont and moved to Palmyra, Ontario, now Wayne County, on the, in the state of New York, when I was in my 10th year, or thereabouts. Uh, again, 1800 and froze to death. I, hopefully you've read the book Saints and seen why they would need to move. This rendezvous with the Hill Cumorah and, and the need to be pushed westward. I was in my 10th year or thereabouts, In about four years after my father's arrival in Palmyra, he moved with his family into Manchester in the same county of Ontario, closer and closer, inching to the, to the Hill Cumorah. His family consisting of 11 souls. This is, I guess, uh, big Latter-day Saint families began at the very beginning, right? Namely, my father, uh, Joseph Smith, my mother, Lucy Smith, whose name previous to her marriage was Mac, daughter of Solomon Mac. Great family lines on both with interesting histories and we don't have time for them. My brother's Alvin, who died November 19th, 1823, in the 26th year of his age. Interesting he'd bring up his death, uh, not just because it's passed by now and he's confirming that or clarifying that history, but also the role of Alvin's death in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Uh, Alvin's excitement for that coming forth. Alvin played a part far beyond the time he spent uh, in the Smith family. Hiram, myself, Samuel Harrison, William, Don Carlos, and my sisters Sophronia, Catherine, and Lucy. This is the first family of the Restoration, and the fact that in spite of differences of personality, William was an interesting person, for example, uh, in spite of a lot of different pulls in different directions before Joseph's experience, this was a family that supported him and followed him all the way through. 
Verse 5, sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. That's uh, putting it lightly. This is the second great awakening. This is the burned over district, as it was called, Western New York. Burned over as in these fires of revival faith. It was intense. Uh, pr prior to this, you would have seen the biggest churches in America being the Congregationalists, for example. Uh, the Anglicans were the established religion in, in colonial period. And... On, in the aftermath of the Second Great Awakening, particularly, you get the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Methodists just swelling in numbers. We'll see them factor in later on. It commenced with the Methodists. They were incredible revivalists, but soon became general among all the sects in that region of country. Indeed, the whole district of country seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, being cre which created no small stir and division among the people. Lots of stir. There was plenty of that. These were tens of thousands of people. This is in a, in a time where most people lived in small country villages and never to see that many people together in one in one place and yet to have this stir, this massive stir where tens of thousands would come and sometimes they would last for days and even weeks where ministers, uh, evangelists would be preaching around the clock, uh, taking turns, different congregations, different or excuse me, different denominations being represented, singing and praying and all kinds of things. Uh, it was, they, they were intense. Some people used to joke that uh, uh, more babies were conceived. There was as much birth as there was rebirth uh, due to revivals. Uh, people being conceived uh, and experiences in the flesh as much as there were experiences in the spirit. Some people would come just as a spectator, uh, wanting to see what was taking place. Others would come to ridicule and make and mock and make fun and just try to uh, oh, kind of derail the spiritual experiences that were taking place. It, it, it was intense, intense times. And division, lots of division. Some crying low here and others low there. Some were contending, interesting word, to contend. This, uh, the, the letters of Paul speak of contending for the faith, but contention, uh, there's going to be both of this taking place. Some contending for the Methodist faith, some for the Presbyterian, some for the Baptist. Again, those were the three that took greatest advantage of the Second Great Awakening. For notwithstanding the great love which these, the converts to these different faiths expressed at the time of their conversion, and the great zeal manifested by the respective clergy, who were active in getting up and promoting this extraordinary scene of religious feeling. That's the other P that this friend of mine mentioned. If Joseph is simply presenting truth as he has it, there were others that are promoting things. Just how do I get people to feel religion? In fact, Joseph Smith himself said at some of these revivals, he would see other people get religion. That was the term that was used. And he wanted to get religion like they did. He wanted to sing and shout. There were all these kind of exercises they call them they're, they're from from the, the jerking exercise to the barking exercise the people would swoon and faint some would get up and swirl and dance uh, all kinds of interesting manifestations some felt were from gods others felt were from the devil uh, later on in the doctrine and covenants joseph will receive a revelation that clarifies some of these things because some of those exercises even started entering into early latter-day saint worship and uh, that's when jo the lord clarifies if it doesn't edify it's not of me i'm not claiming all of the things that people are pegging on me uh, but there are people that are trying to promote religious feeling, extraordinary scenes of it. Uh, and Joseph Smith himself said, I wanted to sing and shout. I wanted to feel it like they did. I just couldn't. I love that about Joseph Smith, that he is not trying to fake it till he makes it. He's not trying to pretend that he's feeling things that he's not. I would say, suggest that, by the way, to any of you who are struggling in your faith or wondering if you have a testimony. No need to fake it. You don't have to pretend to get religion. If you're not feeling what other people are feeling, keep seeking. You don't have to promote feelings within you. You can allow Heavenly Father to present the Spirit and confirm truth as it's been presented to you. And just be patient and wait till it comes. That's what Joseph did. Middle of verse 6. Let them join what sect they pleased. Easier said than done. Yet when the converts began to file off, interesting verb there, just filing off, who am I following? Which, it's interesting sometimes we'll do that, where uh, we use public opinion not as a thermometer, but as a thermostat. Thermometers measure the things that are really there. Thermostats determine temperature based on what you want. Public opinion, which was a huge element, uh, the same time period as when Alexis de Tocqueville, the French traveler, comes and tours the United States and talks about the tyranny of the majority all the time. He talks about public opinion. And public opinion was meant to be 
I want to know what everybody's feeling so that this country can be a true democracy. And yet it ended up being more, or we take it now as more of a thermostat, as we look around to opinion polls, not to say this is what I feel, but rather what am I supposed to feel? Uh, and that's sad to me. We, we lick our fingers and, and put them in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. Uh, and, that's, and that's not how it's supposed to be. When the converts began to file off, are more people going to the Presbyterians? I guess I'm supposed to be Presbyterian. They were the more socially respectable of the three. Uh, oh, people are filing off towards the Methodists? Well, maybe, like, who, who's winning? Which side am I supposed to be on? Uh, they're, they're filing off, some to one party, some to another. It was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real. No wonder if we're promoting, if we're trying to get up religious feeling, no wonder often those feelings end up being more pretended than real. That's another sad aftermath of the history of revivalism. Often you get these massive revivals due to all of this promotion, but after time, that spike in church membership tends to go back down to pre-revival uh, levels, or slightly above pre-revival levels, but nowhere near what they were at the peak of the revival. More pretended than real. For a scene of great confusion and bad feeling, so again, this religious feeling turns into bad feeling. This commitment turns into confusion. This love turns into contention. Priests contending against priests, convert against convert, so that all their good feelings, one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife. There's again that militant word, contend, strife of words and a contest about opinions. And is really that all it is? Are these just words we're throwing around? Are these opinions that we happen to have? Meanwhile, verse 7, I was in this time in my 15th year. My father's family was proselyted to the Presbyterian faith, and four of them joined that church, namely my mother Lucy, my brothers Hiram and Samuel Harrison, my sister Sophronia, Father Smith, by the way, didn't want to have anything to do really with organized religion. Uh, I believe I've read that, that there was a copy of Thomas Paine's Age of Reason on the family bookshelf. Uh, some skepticism. The Age of Reason uh, tries to tear down revealed re religion. Uh, Thomas Paine tore down the monarchy of England in common sense, and then he tried to tear down Christianity in the Age of Reason. And that skepticism was part of Joseph's family background as well. So you've got skeptics or or I'm spiritual, not religious. That would have Joseph Smith Sr. would have loved what millennials are saying these days of, I'm, I'm spiritual, not religious. That was, that was Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, Lucy and some of the kids go in the Presbyterian direction. Others, Joseph Smith himself is going to start leaning somewhere else. Again, this is an open-minded family. This is, we're okay with difference of opinion. This isn't you, my way or the highway. This isn't as long as you're living under my roof, you have to do things my way. There was a, I don't know, an openness in the Smith family that I think served Joseph really, really well and served the early church well, as Joseph himself seemed to be more open-minded than many of his own followers. Uh, there was a Methodist minister that came, to, that came to Nauvoo and wanted to preach, and Joseph says, fine, go for it. And the Methodist minister assumed, well, why even try? You're not going to let me teach what I want to teach. And Joseph was like, no, be right, be my guest. Uh, in his presidential platform, it was, I'll die for the religious freedom of a Baptist or a Presbyterian or anyone as quickly as I die for my own religious freedom. Uh, again, I think part of that is a reflection of his early growing up. And I think there's room in our families and in our faith for people to have difference of opinion, uh, to wonder, to start exploring, trusting that faith is found right here. And if, if we'll trust them with God, God will lead them right. Verse 8, During this time of great excitement, my mind was called up. I love that. His mind is called up as if God were inviting him into a vertical conversation pattern instead of the horizontal ones that his family was being pulled in. Called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness. There's nothing permanently wrong with uneasiness. If you're struggling in your faith, if you're feeling uneasy, if you just don't know, neither did Joseph. But though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. I'm, I'm amazed at how much homework Joseph was willing to do to attend these different churches. I love going to other churches. Uh, when I lived in Tennessee, I would go as often as occasion would permit. And I'd go to the Catholics, and I'd go to the, 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 the Quakers, and I'd go to the Baha'i faith, and I'd go to the Methodists, and the Presbyterians, and the Episcopalians, and, and I loved it to just attend their meetings as often as occasion would permit, to rejoice with them, to see the good that they're doing. 
Uh, Joseph was trying to make sense of it all, and he would attend. But he still kept himself aloof. I'm not going to commit till I know. In process of time, important phrase, be patient with yourself and with the process. In process of time, my mind became somewhat partial to the Methodist sect, and I felt some desire to be united with them. So often when we're exercised, in our search for inspiration, are we still willing to exercise agency along the way? Remember section uh, eight of the doctrine, no, nine of the Doctrine and Covenants to Oliver Cowdery? You took no thought save it was to ask me. You've got to come up with a solution. You need to study it out. Lean in a certain direction. Feel partial. Feel some desire. And then ask me if, if you're right. Then I'll let you know. But God prefers, I've often said that God will give us direction if we will provide momentum. If you've ever had to drive a car without power steering, it is so hard to turn a vehicle that is stationary. But if we'll start moving in a certain direction, it's very easy for God then to turn the wheel. But we need to start the process. So he's leaning in the direction of the Methodists. By the way, in divinity school, I took a whole semester class on the history of Methodism. Amazing faith. I love Methodism. Their hymn book is like twice as big as ours. I'm totally jealous. Uh, John Wesley was an incredible person. His brother Charles, equally so. His mom was amazing, Susanna. Uh, but just, in fact, I was the only non-Methodist in class. And the first day we were going around, there were maybe 30 of us, introducing ourselves. And the professor wanted to ask, or wanted to know, why are we taking this class? 29 out of the 30 said, oh, I have to take this class. I'm studying to become a Methodist minister, and I have to know, I have to know the history of my church. When it got to my turn, I was proudly, hey, I'm so excited to be here. I don't, I don't have to be. I'm, I might be the only non I think I was the only non-Methodist in the room, but also the one who came by choice and not by compulsion. Uh, and then when they were kind of looking at me in disbelief, what, what's a Mormon doing among the Methodists? I just laughed and I said, you know, Joseph Smith, he's our guy. Uh, he, he was this close to becoming Methodist himself. And I'm just curious to see what we missed. Uh, it was a great experience, uh, and, and I was well re received by the Methodists in that class. He felt some desire to unite, but so great were the confusion and strife, same words, among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to come to any certain conclusion. That's what he wanted. I have leanings. I'm somewhat partial, but I want certainty, certain conclusions, who was right and who was wrong. My mind at times was greatly excited. The cry and tumult were so great and incessant. Is this how often truth is on your mind? Is it incessant? Presbyterians were most decided against the Baptists and Methodists and used all powers of both reason and sophistry to prove their errors, or at least to make the people think they were in error. Interesting that how much of the approach here was negative. One religion is decided against another. They're trying to prove errors. They're trying to make people think they are in error. In all of my studies of anti-Mormonism, it's amazing how negative it all seems to be. And it's so much easier to deconstruct someone else's faith than it is to construct faith in something else. So often anti-Mormonism tends to be a zero-sum game. We're, they're either wrong or they're right. And if they're wrong, we must be right. And so often it's not a matter of proving something. They're not inviting you into anything else. They're not trying to prove. They're just trying to disprove. It's a negative approach. Also, by the way, to prove their errors, or at least to make you think they were in error, that speaks volumes. This is faith. You can't really prove or disprove anything. That's not what religion is. It's not a matter of proof. This is the, the, another P, right? Do we present? Do we promote? Do we prove? In this case, you can't prove the things of God, and you can't disprove the things of God. So what are you left with? You hope you can make people think certain things. You're left with rhetoric. You're left with persuasion. You're left with shame. You're left with rumor. You're left with all the stuff Joseph talked about back in verse 1. Evil, designing things, trying to militate against the true character of something. Uh, be, just be aware of that, uh, the attempts that people have make to prove or disprove things when either side is impossible and instead are simply trying to make you think a certain way. They use reason and sophistry more than anything, or at least what they claim to be reasonable and sophisticated. Interesting words, because if I can claim reason to my side, that's what Thomas Paine was doing in attacking Christianity. What was the name of his book? The Age of Reason. We have it all. We're reasonable. They're absurd. We're rational. They're insane. 
uh, to, to see that using claiming reason on our side and then sophistry to try to make it sound sophisticated sophistry the, the love the love of thought uh, philosophy if I can again try to convince you that you're wrong on the other hand verse 9 continues the Baptists and Methodists in their turn were equally zealous in endeavoring to establish their own tenets and disprove all others at least they were trying to establish something on their side that I'm at least grateful for I've had some friends that uh, would come and say oh we learned about you guys at church on Sunday uh, and they'd go be going to some uh, Christian church typically this happened in the South often it even happened in high school in LA I'd have a friend that would come and talk to me about the things this is what we talked about you yesterday at church on Sunday and there were times I would just smile and say you know what I, I hope you don't to take this the wrong way but we never talk about you I guess we're so busy talking about the gospel and the restoration and the fullness that we've been blessed with I don't remember a single Sunday school class in my 45 years of church membership where we said when well, this is how the so-and-so are wrong we, we we're not we're not trying to disprove all others I think it was George Albert Smith. We're not trying to tear down other people's houses to force them into moving into ours. Just build a house. Let people tour it. And let them choose where they want to live. Verse 10. In the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions. Again, militant, military language runs throughout these first 10 verses, doesn't it? I often said to myself, what is to be done? Who, is, who of all these parties are right? Or are they all wrong together? That's a possibility too, as he would soon see. If any one of them be right, which is it? And the real question, how shall I know it? How do we come to know the things of God? 11. We're halfway done. There's the first 10 verses. Verse 11. While I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the con contests of these parties of religionists. And those are difficulties. Those are extreme. When we make religion a contest, when we make the, the search for truth uh, a conflict, no wonder it becomes difficult. But what does he do? I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. That verse opened the heavens initially for Joseph. One of those times where you read a scripture and you think, that was put in that book just for me. Because when Joseph read it, verse 12, Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again. Notice what he just said. The two body parts that were engaged in this wrestle. Remember section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants? He defines revelation as when I speak to the mind and the heart. That is the spirit of revelation as far as God is concerned. Joseph reads this verse from the Scriptures. And what happens? Never had any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force in every feeling of my heart. But then what's next? I reflected upon it again and again. He's feeling things. He's thinking things. This is revelation. This is why this verse of Scripture is coming so powerfully to him. If the Scriptures are boring to you, it's because they're not revelatory. And they become revelatory when they speak to the mind and the heart when you are allowing yourself to feel things and your mind is, is thinking, gaining new insight, seeing things you've never seen before. That's when Scripture study becomes powerful, as it was for Joseph. I knew that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. There's a lot of humility in that statement. How to act, I did not know, and unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. Again, humility. I would come to a point where we can admit to God, I can't figure this out on my own. It's ironic to me that some people want to find God without involving God. Do, do we not see the, the irony, the tragic irony of that? Conversations that I have with people that are trying to understand the things of God, but almost put like this lead shield on neckline and say, only talk to my head. I only want to have a rational, sophisticated conversation. Prove it to me. I don't want you to promote any religious feeling. Okay, I'm not trying to promote, but for me to present religion, which requires revelation, it's going to have to engage both body parts. Uh, how dare we think we can arrive at the truths of God without allowing God to be a part of the process. For the teachers of religion of the, of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. I love the last half of verse 12. 
uh, again, having studied American religious history with its diversity of denominations, that verse sums it up practically perfectly. Why are there so many Protestantisms? Because they all have the Bible. They agreed on that. When Martin Luther separated himself from the Catholic Church, he said, we will not have your priesthood, but we won't need it. We'll have a priesthood of all believers. We won't need your authority. Our authority will be the Holy Word of God. Uh, wonderful thought, but it proves naive because of the lack of interpretive unity. The Bible says all kinds of things to all kinds of different people. The Civil War was the great... Oh, the Civil War convinced people of the reality of what Joseph Smith is here saying in 1838. The Civil War is what taught people, wait a minute, we all... I mean, it's etched in stone on the wall of the Lincoln Memorial, right, from the second inaugural address, that they all pray to the same God and they read the same Bible. They understand the same passages of Scripture so differently. Northern ministers were saying the Bible is anti-slavery. Southern ministers were saying the Bible is pro-slavery. And the churches split before the states did. The Southern Presbyterians, the Southern Methodists, the Southern Baptists, all split from their Northern counterparts. The churches seceded before the states did. In fact, some suggest that maybe that's what precipitated the final split politically. It's like if the churches can't even get along, then how on earth are the states going to? And it all came down to interpretation. We can't agree on what the scriptures say. I do a lot of interfaith work with wonderful people of other faiths. I love it. I love learning with them and from them. I'm amazed at how often, though, our conversations come down to the interpretation of scripture. I've had so many conversations with people that say, well, but the Bible says, like, you interpret the Bible to say, oh, but over here the Bible says, you interpret the Bible to say, and we interpret the Bible to say too. That's all we ever have is interpretation against interpretation. We're some of those teachers of religions of the different sects as well. We understand the same passages of Scripture very differently than our Christian counterparts. The difference is who has the authority to interpret. That could be a topic for a whole other uh, episode someday. Uh, prophets, the authority to interpret Scripture must be on the same level as the authority to reveal Scripture. It must be done through prophets, seers, and revelators. Uh, but Joseph is understanding that early on. They all read the same Bible. They just can't agree with each other. What's, what's the solution then? We have to go one step higher. What I love about Joseph's trip or return to the sources, Joseph going back to the best source he had, the Bible, the verse that struck him most powerfully was the one verse that almost opens up a peephole to go through the scriptures, past, the, behind the scriptures, because it said, if any of you lack wisdom, read the scriptures. No, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God. J Joseph saw that clearly, uh, perhaps for the first time. I went as far as I could, and then it, I got the one verse that told me, you can still go back farther. Ask God. So he did. At 13, at length I came to the conclusion that I must either remain in darkness and confusion, or else I must do as James directs. That's, there's no other option. There's no other solution. And he arrived at that conclusion at length. Do you see all these verses about process of time, how much patience is required? Uh, don't beat yourself up if you still haven't found the truth uh, quickly. I at length, there's that word again, came to the determination. So he first, he, uh, he at length came to the conclusion, and then at length came to the determination. Sometimes the conclusion and the determination are two very different things. I know what I need to do. I've reached the right conclusion. But do I want to do it? I think sometimes that's the harder thing to arrive at. I'm determined I'm actually going to do it this time. To ask of God, concluding that if he gave wisdom to them that lacked wisdom, and would give liberally, and not upbraid, I might venture. I love Joseph's summary in verse 13 to the verse from James in verse 11. What, what stood out to him from that verse? God promised he'd answer. He said he'd do it liberally, that he would be generous with his truth. And he said he wouldn't upbraid. I, I wonder if that's what Joseph was concerned about. Will God be angry at me for asking? Will, will someone doubt me or worry about me or misjudge me if I have a question. I love that. I might venture. I'm going to give this a, ch a shot. I'm, I'm going to chance it. 
admit my uh, ignorance, admit my inability to arrive at truth on my own, that verse gave Joseph confidence, and we need to do that for each other. Verse 14, so in accordance with this, my determination to ask of God, I retired to the woods to make the attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful, clear day. He had no idea just how beautiful and just how clear that day would become for him. Early in the spring, beautiful timing, emerging from a winter of death, of cold, this coming out of the apostasy into a rebirth, a restoration of beautiful new growth, early in the spring of 1820, 200 years ago, right now. It was the first time in my life that I had made such an attempt. For amidst all my anxieties, I had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. I assume he prayed, but to do it vocally, does that make a difference? To me it has. It, there's something about saying something, about doing it out loud, to letting people know what you're thinking, to add that much, one more layer of reality, that you're engaging in a conversation and truly believing that there is a conversation partner. If you've never tried to pray vocally amidst all your anxieties, I, I would suggest you follow Joseph's example here. And maybe that's why Jesus says to enter into your closets. It can still be private, it can still be personal, but it needs to be a conversation with God. Verse 15, after I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go. So he planned this. This was not some fly-by-night seat of the pants. Uh, let's just give it a shot. It was at length. It was conclusion. It was determination. It was act on this. It was anxieties. It was a long time. And he designed in advance to go there. He went, having looked around me and finding myself alone. I love that phrase, too. Reminds me of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. By the end of the conversation, when the conversation that mattered took place, it was just the two of them, as everyone else had left. And Jesus could judge her, and she could see her own situation, independent of anyone else's gaze. I think sometimes we're, we're praying, and we're too focused on the fact we're not alone with God. We want to be heard by others, or we're wondering what other people will think, or again, filing off in certain directions and they're going to want this or they're going to say that. Just alone with God. I kneeled down and notice he didn't say and said my prayers. He said, I kneeled down. He didn't even say and began to pray. The verb he uses for his prayer is beautiful. I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. That offering up is the language of sacrifice. I I had desires, and I gave them to God. I offered them. I kind of desired to be a Methodist. Is that what you want me to do? I will if you want me to. You, I, I desire to be close to my family, and half of them are Presbyterians. Do, is that where you want me to go? I desire, as we'll see later, I desire to fit in. Joseph had such a fun-loving personality, his native cheery temperament. He was an extrovert. He was the life of the party. He loved people. He valued friendship, even to the point of putting his own life in danger over friends, or because of his friendship for them, I should say. He cared what people thought, but he had to even offer that on the altar. I, I desire to be included. I desire to be fit to fit in. I desire not to be made a laughing stock, but I will offer up the desires of my heart to God. I think that's when Moroni and Moroni's promise says we have to pray with real intent. I think that's what he's after. What are you going to do with this? Here's a man, who, a young boy, who is willing to offer up his desires. That's a prayer. I had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me. Satan's timing is often pretty good. Uh, to immediately come when someone has scarcely begun to submit their will to the will of God. Uh, the moment we start turning, where is that verse? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Where the moment we begin to repent, immediately the plan of salvation begins to work for you. I think it's Alma 34. You've turned around, you've done that 180, and boom, now the, the plan of salvation that you had been fighting against now starts working for you. 
And it's interesting that immediately the enemy to the plan of salvation starts to work on us as well. I, it had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Knowing what he was about to speak, no wonder the tongue was bound. Thick darkness gathered around me. It seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. One of Satan's nicknames is the destroyer, and that destruction is real. But, Joseph says in verse 16, exerting all my powers, exertion. What, what kind of power is he exerting? That's interesting. Exerting all my powers. What is he? This is an unseen being, he'll say in, later in this verse. What? Is he throwing punches at an unseen? Satan has no body. He's not corporeal. And so what, what does Joseph mean by exerting all his powers? Well, isn't it in the lectures on faith where he says that faith is mental exertion? It's the principle of power in each of us? So exerting all my powers to call upon God, he could equally have said, and exercising all my faith in God to call upon him to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me at the very moment, again, timing, at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair, abandon myself to destruction, not an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world, and who had such marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. This is real. This is a, this is an unseen power, but an actual being. But in that moment of greatest alarm, the moment he was about to give up, and that's the moment we have to get past, the Lord usually waits until that exact moment. But if we can endure it, then at just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which gradually, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. I loved saying these words as a missionary. Being able to look people in the eye and say in Spanish, Yo vi una columna de luz más brillante que el sol directamente arriba de mi cabeza. To be able to testify of these things was life-changing for me as a missionary. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. He still doesn't even know what this light is, but he's free. And I think so often the Lord frees us even before he introduces himself to us. Often we come to know him through that freeing experience. That's at least been the case for me. The times I come to know God most, most closely and personally are the times of my repentance, when I feel freed from darkness in moments that I was going to give up and I feel delivered. And then I come to know my deliverer. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description. They defy all description. No wonder there are multiple attempts on Joseph's part to explain the first vision. This whole experience defies all description. I'm grateful he gave us as many tries as he did to put the ineffable into words. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. I wish he would have included the first word that came out of Heavenly Father's mouth. Because if he called him by name, and then said, pointing to the other, the complete quote would read, Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him. I testify that God knows our name. He knows our situation. He knows our weaknesses, our strengths. He knows our hopes. He knows the desires of our heart and hopes that we're willing to offer them up to him. He knows us. I love my students. And if there's one thing I wish I knew better was a perfect recall of all of their names. Verse 18, my object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right that I might know which to join. Elder Bednar's pointed out the connection there. It wasn't just I wanted to know it's that I wanted to do. I had real intent. I was going to act on whatever I, answer I got. The sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself. There's that of to get back in possession of myself. Again, these experiences we sometimes have from God are so life-changing, so breathtaking. It's, it takes a while to even come back down from the mountaintop. When I got possession of myself so I was to be able to speak, it's interesting, Satan takes his voice away back in verse 
15, the Father and the Son take his voice away in a, a very different way, a beautiful way here. Once he can speak again, I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which of all the sects was right. For at this time it had never entered into my heart that all were wrong. Earlier he said, could they all be wrong? I guess it crossed his mind, but it never entered into his heart. I mean, it may be like, really? I, may, I guess it's possible. Could we all be off? Maybe this whole thing is false. But to enter into his heart, would God really have left us all with no, I mean, would the, the, the famine be that widespread? It never entered my heart, in which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight. Not all their members, not all their priests, not all, just their creeds. When Elder Holland spoke at Harvard a couple of years ago, and was talking about the issue of our Mormons Christians, he said a, power, a powerful thing. He said, well, are we Christians like, do we believe in Jesus? Oh yeah, definitely. Are we Christians like giving him our sins and relying wholly upon the merits and mercy of his, of his grace? Yes, we're those kinds of Christians. But if you're talking about council convening philosophy flavored Christianity, then no, we're not that kind of Christian. I say that with all respect to my friends of other faiths. Uh, I, I love what you do. I support you. I am grateful for the years we spent together in Divinity School. But I also stand behind restored Christianity over creedal Christianity. Their professors were all corrupt. Now that's a hard one to swallow as well. But those that profess the creeds have been corrupted it doesn't have to be corrupt like you're causing this, but it's been caused to you. Uh, there's an active corrupt and there's a passive corrupt. There's a cause and there's an effect. And I believe that this is the effect. Uh, they have been corrupted. Past participle is what we would use. That, and here he quotes Isaiah 29, They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And that power will include priesthood, that power will include covenants, that power will include God himself revealing himself as he always has through prophets and apostles. That is his method and he's always followed it when his gospel has been upon the earth in its fullness. Verse 20, he again forbade me to join with any of them. And many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. Oh, what I would give to know what else the Lord said to him. So much of what we've seen so far is the don't do. I would love to know more of what the Lord said as far as what to do for Joseph. That will become much more clear. Fast forward 1823 when Moroni comes to give him his mission. Uh, but at this point, all we know for sure is how much of this was what not to do. Among the other things, what were they? I, only, I, I wish we knew. When I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back looking up into heaven. I hope our experiences leave us in that way, looking heavenward, just wanting those experiences to continue, wondering when our next experience with God will be. When the light had departed, I had no strength, none of the natural kind anyway. I bet the spiritual was stronger than ever. But soon recovering in some degree, I went home. What a place to go after an experience with God. And as I leaned up to the fireplace, Mother inquired what the matter was. I replied, never mind, all is well. I am well enough off. There's the understatement of the 19th century. Boy, was he well. And the world would be well as a result. I have learned my, for myself, he says to his mom, that Presbyterianism is, is not true. Nothing against Presbyterianism. I, I love Presbyterianism as well. I've been to their churches also. Uh, but he learned, and he's only singling them out because that was the church that his mother had been proselyte, proselyte, proselyted to. But he knew that there was something missing. Just like there was something missing in his own life something that was going to be filled eventually. He then gives us his aftermath at the end of verse 20. It seems as though the adversary was aware at a very early period of my life that I was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of his kingdom. Else why should the powers of darkness combine against me? Why the opposition and persecution that arose against me almost in my infancy? Here Joseph ends this section, these first 20 verses, on the same note as he did at the beginning. This persecution against the character of the church in its rise. Opposition and persecution. Why? Because Joseph really was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer. I love those two words. 
having spent much of my career with teenagers who are often described as disturbing or annoying. I love those words. President Packer used to say the only problem with teenagers is that there aren't enough of them. And so if you've ever been called annoying, just tell people you're following the prophet's example. But please make sure you're annoying the right things, or in this case, the wrong things. Uh, make sure you're disturbing and annoying the adversary in his attempts to thwart the work of God. There's so many more layers, I'm sure, that we could un you know, peel away from the 20 verses that we've been studying for the last hour. I hope that the experience has been a positive one for you. It has been for me. Uh, to me, perhaps the most powerful part was just reminiscing in between the lines of experiences I've had where the Holy Ghost has testified to me that this, this account really is true. When I was in high school, President Gordon B. Hinckley was supposed to come to Los Angeles, where I grew up, to speak in a big regional conference. It was going to be in some big oh, theater or something downtown LA, I can't remember the, the venue. But there was going to be a regional choir. And I figured that was the closest I would get to the prophet was to be able to sing to the back of his head. So I joined the choir. I'm grateful they let me in, in spite of my lack of talent. And we were going to sing two songs. Uh, one was How Great Thou Art, and the other was Joseph Smith's First Prayer. Uh, one song dedicated to the greatest who ever lived on this earth, Jesus Christ, and the other to one who has done more than any other person, save Jesus only, to bring us back to him. Joseph Smith. I remember I was in my stake center as a high school kid practicing Joseph Smith's first prayer for our little stake portion of the larger regional choir that would later assemble. And we were singing Joseph Smith's first prayer. I was in the back left-hand corner among the basses and singing, Oh, how lovely was the morning. Joseph said it was beautiful. Radiant beam of the sun above. And I can't remember at what point I was in the song, but all of a sudden I stopped singing because I couldn't keep singing. The Spirit was testifying to me in an unmistakable and undeniable way that what I was singing about was true, that it really happened, that this wasn't just a song that we were singing. This wasn't just a, a made up fairy tale to this day that experience has been life-changing. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it because he was the one that was helping me know at the time that it was real. I've always loved that song ever since. In fact, if I could rewrite that fourth verse, Joseph, this is my beloved, hear him, oh, how sweet the words. I've always dreamed of an arrangement where the men were singing Joseph, and then a pause to let that sink in. Make it all a cappella. Just Joseph. Instead of, Joseph, this is my beloved, hear him, O oh, sweet the word. We, we, the meter of the song forces us to run through it. But Joseph, pause. I know you. You are known of me. This is my beloved. Pause. Do you know him? You need to. Hear him. My one complaint of the meter of the song is it's hear him, oh, how sweet the word. And if the tabernacle choir were singing it, I could just envision the men hear him while the women immediately chime in like this choir of angels. Oh, how sweet the word. Just let the father hold on to his note. Hear him as the choir. How sweet the word. That word is sweet. I am grateful for the prophet Joseph Smith. I do not worship him. I know too many of his, foible, his foibles and his frailties and his faults, which he admits, those are his words from Joseph Smith history. I've read too much about Joseph Smith to ever worship him. But to know he was a prophet, I've also read too much about Joseph Smith to doubt that. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for both sides that keep him where he needs to be far below divinity, but on the upper reaches of humanity to help connect the two and point us home. I'm grateful for him. 
I testify that he is a prophet of God who saw what he said he saw. I am grateful for my testimony of the first vision and pray that it may carry me through until I get to see as I'm seen and know as I am known until someday I hear Jared this is my beloved son hear him I know that voice will be familiar to me then because it's growing familiar to me now as I read and study his words may this season of bicentennial be a blessing to you as you come to know Joseph as a means to truly come to know Christ as an end. And I leave that with you with my love and my hopes for you during this season that you might feel restored to your relationship with God through this ongoing restoration. Thank you, President Nelson, for this invitation. And thank you, Joseph, for the opportunity to have a fresh read of your amazing words. All right. Did you make it? Did you endure it well? Like I said, I hope you were able to look past the video and hear past the audio and feel some things from the Holy Ghost. But turn with me now to verse 21. And this is the immediate aftermath of the first vision. Some few days after I had this vision, I happened to be in company with one of the Methodist preachers who was very active in the aforementioned religious excitement. Remember, Joseph had been leaning in the Methodist direction. And having attended meetings as often as occasion would permit, he probably has come to know several of these ministers fairly well. Well, they were conversing on the subject of religion. Go figure, that was on everybody's mind during the Second Great Awakening. But Joseph took occasion to give this minister an account of the vision which I had had. Now, the next phrase lets us know what he expected. He says, I was greatly surprised at his behavior. What was his reaction? Because that'll tip us off to what Joseph's expectation had been. I was greatly surprised at his behavior because he treated my communication not only lightly, but with great contempt. Now we'll come right back to that reaction, but take a second and ponder what the expectation had been on Joseph's part. The fact that he was greatly surprised by this lets you know what his expectation was to begin with. Wouldn't this be exactly what this minister was hoping would happen? Ministers are trying to introduce you to God through his word. Well, Joseph had had the, the living word appear to him. And yet, what did he get instead? On the one hand, a shrug of the shoulder, a roll of the eye. They, he treated it lightly. But also beyond that, kind of to intensify that lightness, he treated it with contempt, which suggests that it was something so infinitely beneath him. It's not even worth fighting against or worrying about. It's like, are you kidding me? And with that shrug and rolled eye, let's just move on. Now, we'll see the opposite counterpart of that in just a moment. But I want you to think about this surprise on Joseph's part. Reminds me of King Lamoni, actually, after he's converted by Ammon's message. And the two of them are heading off to the next uh, village to be able to continue sharing the gospel. And they happen to run into King Lamoni's father. And Lamoni has news for him. Dad, sorry I missed the party that you threw for all of your sons, but you'll, you're never going to believe what happened to me. I have been born again. This Nephite missionary has come and shared the everlasting gospel with me, and I, and I want to share it with you. And his dad is so angry by this that first he tries to kill Ammon, then he tries to kill King Lamoni himself. I mean, this is not what King Lamoni expected. In fact, that's what he says. In Alma 20, 13, it says, Now when Lamoni had rehearsed unto him, his father, all these things about his conversion, behold, to his astonishment, his father was angry with him. Do you get a sense of that astonishment? That surprise, to borrow Joseph Smith's word? King Lamoni assumed, expected, that his father would be as thrilled by this miraculous conversion as he had been. Now, fast forward, and eventually he was with the help of Aaron and, and a missionary experience of his own. He had to have his own spiritual experience in order to understand and honor and appreciate his son's spiritual experience. And until that happened, it was only doubt and anger. But again, I love that King Lamoni is astonished by that. He went into this missionary message fully assuming that faith would be forthcoming. 
And that speaks volumes of Lamoni's own faith. This surprise on the part of a 14-year-old Joseph speaks to his faith as well. Honestly, it reminds me of full-time missionaries. When you knock on a door, when you meet somebody in the street and you begin to share the gospel with them, what do you expect will happen? Do you have faith in the possibility of their faith? Or have you had so many doors slammed in your face that you've kind of come to expect it? Real faith as a sharer of the gospel, whether full-time missionary or member missionary, comes when every rejection on their part is met by surprise and astonishment on ours. Wow, that's so shocking that they didn't feel the same power that I've felt about these things. Well, maybe it's just not their time. But I'll keep my faith firm and my eye open for later opportunities. And if they reject me then, I'll still be as surprised as ever. And I love the humble, simple faith of this young boy, expecting this Methodist minister to be thrilled for him and for himself, thrilled for the world. Well, like I said, he wasn't. And so what does he do? He said it was all of the devil, which again is ironic. To believe in the devil more than you believe in God in some ways. To just, again, to trap God in a box, the Bible, uh, to, to confine him under lock and key, and worse than even chalk it up to a figment of Joseph's imagination. That was actually something that a neighbor said later, that these must have simply been the imaginings of a pure-minded boy. I love that description, a pure-minded boy. From his perspective, I don't think he saw God in Jesus, but I don't think he was trying to trick the world. I don't think, he, again, this is where skepticism has not yet turned into cynicism where I don't believe, but I'm not attacking the character of the person that is claiming these things. I, I'm okay with skepticism, but cynicism, man, that, there's a heaviness there. That's, that's hard to deal with. That's when you're maligning or mistrusting the character of the person, questioning their motives rather than just their experiences. For any of you who may be struggling in your faith and dealing with skepticism, that's fine. But please be careful not to allow it to descend into cynicism because it changes your perspective on people in general. It makes you a little harder to live with, to be honest, because it keeps you from giving anybody the benefit of your doubt. Now back to what the minister is saying. Again, if he's saying that this is just of the devil, interesting that he would assume that the devil can perform miracles and not believe that God can perform miracles himself. All because, like he says in the next phrase, there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days. All such things had ceased with the apostles. There would never be any more of them. You get a sense there that he's already passed judgment before the trial? That his premise has predetermined his conclusion, just like we talked about at the beginning of this lesson? If you don't believe in visions, then by default, your a priori reasoning, before you've even had the court case, you have hammered down the, the gavel and said, guilty, yeah, this cannot happen. That is a prejudice. The word prejudge, prejudice. That's exactly what's happening here. I believe in a God who spake, but not in a God who speaks. I believe in a God who was, but I have a little more concern about a God who is. Remember Ralph Waldo Emerson. And then in verse 22, we see the opposite extreme from what we see from this Methodist minister. I soon found, however, that my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice, there's that word, prejudgment, against me among professors of religion, and was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase. Now we'll see that same word, persecution, appear several more times in these verses, and we'll see it throughout Joseph Smith's life, and even in our day, although the form of persecution has become less violent, thankfully. But notice the two forms side by side. In verse 21, it was more of the flippant shrugging of the shoulder and rolling of the eyes. To treat something lightly, to treat it with contempt. This is so far beneath me. Why am I even wasting my time entertaining this, this conversation? And then in 22, you see the opposite extreme where you blow it out of proportions and make it so big that it is worth fighting against and persecuting. You see, in 21, it's this process of minimizing, and 22, it's the process of maximizing. And again, the goal is the same. They don't care. 
like we saw with the first vision at the beginning of today's lesson. Do we minimize the historiography? He never talked about it. Do we maximize the historiography? Oh, he talked about it too many times in too many different ways. In this case, and, and I've seen this so often throughout the history of anti-religious rhetoric and anti-religious persecution, that both of those things will happen simultaneously, even though they're at odds with one another. Is this a big deal that we should fight it and persecute? Or is this no big deal that we should just laugh at it and mock? Do you sense this irony of doing both at the same time or one after the other? If I can't get you to think less of them, then let me have you think too much of them. I call this to dehumanize and to demonize. And either one is a good option if you're trying to attack somebody else's faith. To dehumanize them, it, it, again, these are laughable. These people are idiots. In fact, in some of my study of, of racist humor and of anti-religious ridicule, it's amazing that with racist jokes and with anti-Semitic jokes, often they go hand in hand that this other culture or this other nationality or this other faith, they're idiotic. They're complete imbeciles. They're stupid. They're so far beneath us, we don't have to worry about them at all. But at the same time, there's all these other jokes about how cunning they are and how sly they are. It's, again, it's like, make up your mind. Do they have so little intelligence that they are laughable? Or do they have so much intelligence that somehow they're weaseling their way in and these conspiracy theories and they're going to take over the world? You see a lot of that in anti-Semitic humor. And you're seeing the same thing here with a 14-year-old boy. Keep an eye out for that in the anti-Mormonism that you sometimes encounter. Is it trying to make you into something laughably less than or perilously greater than? Neither one is really true. Again, Joseph is surprised by that side as well. He's surprised by the lightness and contempt in 21. He's surprised by the persecution in 22. Notice how he describes it. I was an obscure boy. You get a sense of how he viewed himself at the time. I was a nobody had the most common name imaginable, Joseph Smith. I was from a poor family of no-namers. Why would you attack me? I was an obscure boy. I was only between 14 and 15 years of age. My circumstances in life were such that I would be a boy of no consequence in the world. Then why on earth would men of high standing take notice sufficient to excite the public mind against me and create a bitter persecution and this was common among all the sects, all united to persecute me. I guess that's one thing they had in common. We don't like this boy that is claiming an open heaven. We do not want to allow for a God who speaks directly because then he's eliminated the middlemen, namely ourselves, the clergy. The clergy had been dealing with a loss of authority and of social prestige for decades. And most of them wanted to hold on to whatever power and authority and privilege and prestige that they had. And so for a, a nobody, a 14-year-old boy of no consequence, well, the growth of any other church was not inconsequential to them. And notice what they tried to do. They tried to excite the public mind against them. The wicked judges tried to do that to Nephi in the book of Helaman. Remember that? where they're trying to get everybody up in arms and like, well, why don't you attack him? Don't you see what he's doing? The wicked leaders in Jerusalem were doing the same thing with Jesus, trying to get the crowds behind them, right? If, if I can wash my hands of this and just make it a, a popular uprising against this perceived enemy of the masses, then I don't have to be the guilty one. There's no blood on my hands. And boy, is popular opinion fickle. Have you noticed that? How often and how quickly public opinion can change. It is so malleable. And so here are these, these leaders, these religious leaders of the time, trying to excite the public mind. The internet has made that so much easier for people to be able to do. To be able to manipulate your thoughts and your emotions to the point that you're no longer thinking for yourself. I've often warned my students about this that the internet tends to facilitate shallow and unoriginal thought. But boy, is it good at exciting the masses to think certain things. And if they can get anti-Mormon sentiment to go viral, that's what happened in Missouri, where the public mind was so excited against the Latter-day Saints 
that the governor signed an extermination order. That's Nazi Germany, where Hitler excited the public mind so much against the Jews that anti-Semitism could turn into a Holocaust. Please beware of groupthink and echo chambers and herd mentality and just following the masses wherever they happen to be charging mindlessly. Beware of those that try to excite the public mind, especially when they're trying to incite the mind into the muscle and actual persecution results. Verse 23, Joseph then kind of pauses here and, and lets us know what's going on in his mind rather than just the public mind. It caused me serious reflection then, and often has since. That phrase, by the way, serious reflection, describes Joseph so beautifully. His mother, Lucy Mack, said, Of all my children, Joseph was probably the least inclined to book study. That just wasn't the way he was wired. But the most inclined to serious reflection. And here he is wondering why things are the way they are, as far as people's responses to him is concerned. How very strange it was. Again, there's this surprising nature. He expected something different. You see, he not only had faith in God, he had faith in humanity. But how strange it was that an obscure boy, there's a lot of similarities in how he describes himself in 23 to what he did in 22. An obscure boy, a little over 14 years of age, and one too who was doomed to the necessity of obtaining a scanty maintenance by his daily labor. See, those who want to accuse Joseph Smith of get-rich-quick schemes, are you serious? You want to get rich quick? There were far easier ways of doing that in frontier America than what Joseph is trying to do in explaining the experiences he's had with God. Again, it was strange for him, it was surprising for him, that he should be thought a character of sufficient importance. You sense his meekness, his humility again? to attract the attention of the great ones of the most popular sects of the day, and in a manner to create in them a spirit of the most bitter persecution and reviling. There it is again. Are we on the minimize, the dehumanize, the lightness and contempt, or are we on the maximize, the demonize, the persecution and reviling? Either way, strange or not, so it was, and it was often the cause of great sorrow to myself. We'll see more of that next week as we continue in Joseph Smith history and get more of a sense of his personality and why he would be so sorrowful both for him and for them that they can't see past the popular opinion. They can't think past the incited and excited popular mind that they won't approach his words with their own serious reflection to find out for themselves if it's true. He thought better of them than that. Verse 24 begins with the word however and then says nevertheless. So you see a pivot here. This is the direction that the, that the river is flowing towards skepticism and animosity, towards contempt and reviling. However, let me put my, my oar in the water and start turning this boat around. Nevertheless, let me start swimming upstream counterculturally. However, it was nevertheless a fact. And keep your eye out in the next few verses for that language of conviction. In, it was a fact that I had beheld a vision. I have thought since that I felt much like Paul when he made his defense before King Agrippa and related the account of the vision he had when he saw a light and heard a voice, but still there were but few who believed him. Some said he was dishonest. Others said he was mad. Again, they don't care how they accuse you as long as it comes down to the same verdict at the end. You might be dishonest and scheming and an enemy to be concerned about and persecute. Or you might be crazy and someone to just be laughed at and ridiculed and, and shrugged away and ignored. We don't care which extreme you come from as long as you end up at the same destination of disbelief. He was ridiculed and reviled, just like I've been, but, here was, turn it upstream again, all this did not destroy the reality of his vision. He had seen a vision. He knew he had. 
All the persecution under heaven could not make it otherwise. And Paul's the life, the remainder of it, bore evidence of that fact. Same with Joseph Smith. Though they should persecute him unto death. And that's exactly what they did with Paul. And unbeknownst to Joseph Smith here, as he writes in 1838, it would eventuate in the same thing for him. Though they should persecute him and Joseph unto death, yet they both knew and would know to their latest breath that they had both seen a light and heard a voice speaking unto them, and all the world could not make them think or believe otherwise. I think there's power in changing all of those singular pronouns, him and he, to the plural pronouns of them and they. Because Joseph and Paul really did become one in this verse. That's how Joseph saw himself. In fact, that, I think, is worth dwelling on for a moment as well. That when it came to times of persecution, who did Joseph relate to? Remember that great phrase at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, where he speaks of this, this cloud of witnesses that you get to be a part of. That's the point that Joseph is making. I, I'm stepping into that cloud of witnesses. I am a witness myself. And who does he relate to during times of, of persecution? He relates to Paul. If Paul can do this, so can I. If he can endure it, so can I. If he can face contempt and reviling, people calling him dishonest, others calling him crazy, then I'm in good company. And I can do this too. It's interesting, throughout Joseph's life, there are different prophets that he resonates with. Like I said, during persecution, he resonates with Paul. During times of testing and trial and, and sacrifices being asked, it's amazing how often Joseph Smith invokes the example of Abraham. That we as members of the church are going through an Abrahamic trial and being asked to make an Abrahamic sacrifice. And later, as Joseph is gathering the saints and really trying to build Zion, who does he relate to most? Enoch. In fact, he uses that as a code name for himself in some of the revelations that, that might incite more persecution later on. I am Enoch trying to build a city to bring back to God. You see what Joseph's doing? Can we find scriptural examples? He's facing so much peer pressure that he decided to look for a different group of peers, prophetic ones stepping into that cloud of witnesses, realizing that you do have more backup than you realize, that more are those that be with us than those that be with them. Now, this is such a great example to follow. As Joseph says at the beginning of 25, so it was with me. Honestly, the more often you can say that phrase in your scripture study, then the more powerful and more personal your scripture study has become. When you're reading about Nephi building the ship and you realize that he has this impossible task before him, but he's turning to God in, in his extremity, you can say, so it was with me. He's come through for me when I have a challenge in front of me. When you have so much to do in life and you're being pulled in temporal and in spiritual directions, and you read the story of Mary and Martha and you think, so it was with me. Again, there is so much power in finding scriptural peers and stepping into the cloud of witnesses. As Joseph does that, stepping into Paul's shoes for a moment, notice his conviction in 25, which mirrored Paul's conviction in 24. I had actually seen a light. Like I said, keep your eye out for the language of conviction. I had actually seen a light. And in the midst of that light, I saw two personages. And they did, in reality, speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. And while they were persecuting me, reviling me, speaking all manner of evil against me falsely for so saying. See what he just did there? Once again, he called upon scriptural witnesses. He found biblical backup. He found a better group of peers to fight the peer pressure he was facing. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Those are the words that are running through Joseph's mind as he's writing this. I am in good company. So persecuted they, the prophets that went before me. 
I am doing this for Jesus' sake, just as they did. And through it all, he continues, I was led to say in my heart, why persecute me for telling the truth? I'm not dishonest. I'm not crazy. I have actually seen a vision. And then he shifts his perspective from the public mind that is excited against him to the mind of God that has revealed itself to him. He lets us know here beautifully whose opinion really mattered to him. Who am I that I can withstand God? Why does the world think to make me deny what I have actually seen? You see in that one sentence, who, whose opinion are you most concerned about? God's or the world's? You're going to have to withstand one or the other. Once you've had spiritual experiences and gained a testimony and know these things to be true for yourself, then you're either going to have to stand up to the world or you're going to have to stand up to God. As he says in this next phrase, I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it, neither dared I do it. At least I knew that by so doing, I would offend God and come under condemnation. Again, take your pick. Who are you going to offend? Joseph chose to offend the world and face their condemnation rather than offend God and face his own. Where are you laying up your treasures? On earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, or in heaven, whose opinion is weighing heavier upon you? And I love the way he said it. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it. He was there too. What do you know that God knows that you know? You understand the difference in that question? It's one thing to go, yeah, I I believe this, I know this. It's another thing to say, oh boy. God knows that I know that because he was there when he revealed it to me. Denying that experience would be denying God who was a part of that experience with me. It's a great question to ask yourself as you are inventorying your personal spiritual experiences, as you're putting things on shelf number one that I've talked about in the past. Not just what do I know, but what does God know that I know? What knowledge has he given me directly. He then says in verse 26, I had now got my mind satisfied so far as the sectarian world was concerned. Great phrase. My mind is now satisfied. The words that Paul uses in some of his letters, that he can be grounded and rooted and established and settled. My mind is satisfied. My heart is too. And I'm going to hold on to those things, those revelatory experiences, throughout all the shaking that is going to come later on. There's a great Joseph Smith translation addition to Luke chapter 14, where the Lord has just said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And that's the road of discipleship that Joseph Smith is beginning to to traverse. I'll be bearing a cross for the rest of my life. Am I willing to do that? Can I count the cost? Well, here's the addition that Joseph makes by inspiration to that verse. Wherefore, settle this in your hearts, that ye will do the things which I shall teach and command you. I love that phrase. Settle it in your heart. I've often worked with people that are struggling in their faith, and and they're, they're doing okay for a while, and then they come back. And they're doing okay for a while. And then they come back. And it's like, at what point are you going to settle this in your heart? I'm not saying that you shouldn't keep asking questions and keep searching for truth. But at what point are you going to hold on to the spiritual witnesses you've been given and have it decided, settled, established? At what point will your mind be satisfied and your heart sufficiently comforted to know that God has spoken to you. And no matter the moments of silence that might follow, the dark nights of the soul, this has been settled in your heart. You know it. And you know that God knows it. Paul held on to his vision on the road to Damascus until it took him to Rome and the grave. And Joseph Smith held on to his experience in the grove until it led him ultimately to Carthage. Both of those mighty men had settled it in their hearts 
to do the things that God had told them, to hold on to the experiences that they'd had. They had their minds satisfied. I pray that the same can become true of you and me. There is something calm and comforting about a settled faith that's not being pulled about by every wind of doctrine, that's not shaken by every concern that comes up in the next anti-Mormon meme. This is settled. My mind is satisfied. I know the experiences I've had. Joseph then ends this section. He was satisfied that it was not his duty to join with any of them, but to continue as I was until further directed. That's one thing he was holding out for. I know more light and truth will come. And how does he sum it all up? I had found the testimony of James to be true. Interesting, he goes back to scripture. The scripture that initiated this experience, he's experimented upon the word and the experiment has proved fruitful. It happened exactly as James had promised, that a man who lacked wisdom might ask of God and obtain and not be upbraided. Now notice what Joseph just did with that verse from James. He switched the order slightly. The way James says it is that if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And how's, how's he end? What's the last thing that, that James wants in your mind? And it shall be given him. In Joseph's case, he just switches the order at the end. Yes, if you ask God, you will obtain. But what was still lingering in his mind? What was that last takeaway? And you won't be upbraided. What has he just spent the last six verses talking about? Being upbraided by the world, by professors of religion, by people that should have been his friends. We'll see that phrase next week. By men of high standing in 22, by the great ones of the popular sects in 23. Almost everyone he shared this experience with, he was met with upbraiding of reviling, of contempt, of persecution. But he didn't feel that from God. And that made all the difference to him. It should make all the difference to those that we love that may be struggling in their faith. So often they hesitate to ask you their questions because they're afraid of being upbraided. They're afraid what people will think that just hearing your question and you're going to rush to the conclusion that, oh, they're an apostate. They're about to leave the church and begin to attack it. They just are wondering something. So let them ask. Don't upbraid them. You may not have all the answers, but usually it's not our ignorance that keeps people from asking us questions. It's their fear of our reaction to them. I love how open Joseph Smith was to people's questions. That's what precipitated so many of the revelations that we find in the Doctrine and Covenants. You got a question? So do I. Let's ask God together. Or you have a question of me? I'm happy to talk about this. I will not upbraid you. I will not think less of you for wondering. In fact, I won't even think less of you for disbelieving me. As he once said, I don't blame anyone for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I would not have believed it myself. This is the ineffable after all. This is the transcendent. This is so far beyond the norm. And the only way you'll come to know it for yourself is by experiencing something similar. A parting of the veil. An opening of the heavens. Perhaps not a first vision on the scale of Joseph's, but a revelation, an impression, a spiritual confirmation that this all happened in reality. I testify that you can know this and that God wants to help you know it. I promise that no matter what other people might say, God will not upbraid you. So ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And what will be opened? Prepare yourself for all that you will experience on the other side of that door.